Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Institute for Work and Health's uh, monthly speaker series. I hope everyone had a really wonderful Thanksgiving and you enjoyed the, the great weather. I am delighted to uh, be chairing today's meeting. My name is Arif Jetta, and I'm Associate Scientific Director and Scientist at the Institute. Uh, today's speaker is Dr. Abby Biswas. And before I introduce uh, Dr. Biswas, uh, I just want to provide a couple key housekeeping points. Uh, the first is that uh, we offer closed captioning, and so if you require it, you can go into the bottom right-hand corner and, uh, and turn on the closed caption feature. Uh, secondly, uh, we will be taking uh, questions and answers uh, after the presentation or after Dr. Biswas's presentation. So uh, you can enter those questions into the Q&A function, and a member of our team uh, will answer those questions. Uh, we just wanted to highlight that we do get a lot of folks who are joining us today, and so we might not get to everyone's uh, questions. And so if you do have questions that haven't been answered by Dr. Biswas, we do uh, uh, we do encourage you to reach out to him directly, uh, and he'll definitely respond to your queries. Uh, and so with that, uh, I'm just going to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Abby Biswas. Uh, Abby is a scientist at the Institute for Work and Health and an assistant professor in epidemiology at the University of Toronto's Dalalana School of Public Health. Dr. Biswas's research involves exploring the complex factors that, that influence workers' participation in physical activity and understanding the benefits uh, and potential risks of physically demanding occupations. Dr. Biswas's presentation is entitled How the Physical and so uh, Social Environment Shape commuters' choices to bike or walk to work. And in this presentation, he will share results from a recent study examining how Canadians' decisions to walk or bike to work may be shaped by both their physical work environments uh, as well as their social environments. And in this presentation, he uses census data. So with, with that, I'll turn it to Dr. Biswas, uh, and we look forward to your presentation and the Q&A. Thank you very much, Arif. Um, good morning, and thank you all for joining me today, and happy Thanksgiving. And so I just want to start off by saying that, uh, as Arif mentioned, this is a study that is uh, reporting, you know, uh, well, findings from a recent study, and we are now in the midst of developing this into peer-reviewed publications, and so please stay tuned, and once we have publications to report we will be sharing that, putting that in the ether and the usual channels on the website and so forth. And so please stay tuned. And that being said, I'm very much looking forward to your questions, comments, and feedback. And so I am one half of the principal investigator team. Uh, this project was co-led uh, by Stephanie Prince Ware of the Public Health Agency of Canada, who lends tremendous expertise around occupational physical activity, as well as understanding how built environment factors correlate or influence physical activity and health among different Canadian populations. Now, the rest of our study team includes Cynthia Chen and Peter Smith from the Institute for Work and Health, Paul Villeneuve, Carleton University, and Justin Lang, also from the Public Health Agency of Canada. I just want to acknowledge our funder, the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, and with a very specific pocket, pocket of money or grant uh, that is for healthy cities research. I also want to thank the custodians of the data that we were able to work with. So the Canadian Urban Environmental Health Research Consortium, or CANU, and Statistics Canada via its Toronto Region Research Data Centre. We're also advised by stakeholders or experts in the areas of city planning, active transportation, and public health. And so these stakeholder advisors provided us with feedback and input in the conceptualization of our study, as well as reflections on the key findings. And so if you have to step away by the end of the, before the end of the talk, I have two main takeaway messages for you. The first is what we call supportive physical environments. So these are encompassing what we call good, clean air, more walkable and cyclable infrastructure and green areas. All of these together can promote more active commuting, walking and biking to work. You know, this may not seem as a surprise to you, but what we think is a very interesting finding is that when these environments are around where people experience greater instability or deprivations, areas what we call low social environments, these have a bigger effect in promoting active commuting. Now, when we think about the whole active commuting journey, we think about 
moving from home to the workplace. And so when we consider the environments around where we live and where we work, we found that the environments in these two locations together contribute towards supporting active community. And so the broader context of why I do this research, why we do this research is in order to understand ways in which we can promote more physical activity and exercise among Canadian adults. And so the Canadian, Canadian adult population, put bluntly, is not exercising enough or to realize the health benefits. And so most recent statistics indicate that about one in two Canadian adults meet the physical activity guidelines, what we call 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous intensity physical activity every week. So that's exercise that gets your heart pumping, gets you to a sweat, maybe makes it hard for you to form sentences. And there's generally a, a, a slightly more number of males that meet these guidelines than females, but it's generally around 49% of the population that meet the guidelines. So not enough. And we find that this level has stayed about the same in the last decade or so. There's been some small improvements, but generally levels have stayed about stagnant. Um, and there needs to be more creative and strategic investments and interventions to promote greater levels of physical activity in the Canadian population in order for these people to realize the health benefits that come from this really effective um, intervention, prescription medicine that we call exercise. And so when we think about the barriers that Canadian adults experience in order to exercise more, we have to be thinking about work. And that work in itself is something that most of the working age population engages in. We are very much influenced by our working lives in, our, in the rest of our lives. We, if we have long working hours that may influence our motivation, our fatigue, and the amount of time we have available to engage in exercise outside of work. If we have a demanding or uh, like a physically demanding or a stressful job, it may mean that we don't have enough energy to engage in exercise outside of work. And if we have an inflexible job, a job where it's not very possible for us to incorporate exercise during work hours, then it may already be hard for us to incorporate uh, exercise during moments when you know, we spend time at work, which is a large part of our day. And so we naturally then thought about other strategies to promote physical activity among the working age population. And one that we landed on is active commuting. And active commuting, walking and biking to work offers a practical way for workers to increase their daily physical activity in that people who walk and bike to work engage in physical activity before they start work and then have time to do other things. They've already you know, met a big chunk of their, their recommendations for physical activity. And so it's a practical way for workers to incorporate physical activity. It, because you're increasing physical activity, it offers the health, same health benefits of physical activity. And that includes reducing your risk for mortality from all causes, reducing your risk for heart disease, and re reducing your risk for diabetes. And of course, because you're not burning any carbon gases, carbon emissions from walking or biking, it has environmental benefits as well. And also promoting active commuting and understanding ways in which we can promote active commuting comes at an opportune time in that there's national interest through the National Active Transportation Strategy in understanding ways in which we can invest in infrastructure that is supportive of greater active transportation in Canadians and, and among Canadians. And so this is meant to not only support Canada's carbon emission goals, but also to get more Canadian families to be active. And so this is a figure from a study that was done by Gabriella Christopher, who is who was a past student of ours and what it is, it looked at different forms of commuting across Canada, across occupations. And what it essentially shows is that levels of walking and biking to work pale far in comparison to people who use the motorized vehicles. So that's probably not surprising. And so if you look at the green and the yellow bars at the bottom, those indicate levels of walking and cycling to work between the years of 2006, 2011, and 2016 using, using versions of the census. And you compare that to the orange at the top, which is use of motor vehicles. And you see that these levels are pretty consistently low across different occupational groups. Now, there's some variation, and that variation we think is probably because of jobs which are more demanding, makes it harder for you to make, to, to choose to engage in active commuting. 
But there's also two positive messages from this. And one is in the blue. And so those blue lines indicate public transit use. And so when you engage in public transit use, you use the subway, you take the bus, you do incorporate some forms of active transport. You're walking or biking to and from your bus stops. And so there is an extra me measure or level of active commuting that we're seeing by incorporating active, uh, using public transit use in our measures. And also these low levels to us incorporate um, mean opportunity for us. And so the more, you know, I mean, the lower levels mean that there's a lot of opportunity for us to really move the needle towards increasing these levels of active commuting during what is a routine period of time for many workers. And so when we think about health behaviors and the factors that influence active transportation, any behaviors, we talk of what is called a social and ecological framework. And that's what this onion shows. And so what that really means is that there's various factors in our lives, in our individual experiences and the experiences and our interactions with others that really shape our decision-making around engaging in unhealth behavior. So at the core of the onion is us, our beliefs, our attitudes, our understandings. And then as we move away from the core come more interactions with people. So it's our relationships with others, our relationships with institutions and organizations and communities. And at the very surface of the onion is our built environment or our structural environments. And so you can tackle these factors and think about how we can intervene and think about ways in which we can promote active transportation by factoring in one of these individual factors or these specific factors. But ideally, you want to be incorporating as many of these factors together because together they make an influence on our behaviors. Now, I'll be talking about the structural factor, so the built environment and the physical environment. So this incorporates our infrastructure for walking and cycling. This can include experiences of traffic safety and traffic, access to public transit, and so forth. And we think about the value of built environments in terms of promoting physical activity and active transportation because it really makes a big influence. So there's a lot of potential in making influences on populations of people. And so we call these upstream determinants of behaviors, upstream determinants of, of health. And they're essentially the causes of the causes or causes of the root causes. And we find that our experiences with the built environment are not a uniform, uniformly experienced. And so people of different neighborhoods, of different backgrounds experience diff built environments differently. So where you live can influence type of parks, the type of pedestrian infrastructure and walking and, and biking infrastructure you experience, and your experiences of equity and marginalization and discrimination and your relationships within your communities can influence your behaviors and your decision-making around engaging in walking and biking. And so it's really important for us to recognize that built environments can vary and can vary for different social environments. And factoring in the two together can really help us get a more complete understanding of the factors that can influence active transportation. And so when we look at what the literature today tells us, we know a lot about the environments around where we live, and we know some things about the environments around where we work. And so the most, one of the most important factors associated with our, or our decision making around commuting to work is our dis distance to work. And so a shorter distance to work would mean that we're more likely to choose walking and cycling to work. Now, if you have more intersections, our commute to work becomes more pedestrian and cycle friendly. And so that's also something that the literature says is supportive of active commuting. And so having more pedestrian and cyclist friendly infrastructure, both around the home and the workplace environments can be supportive, as well as having areas where you can stop over, as we call points of interest. So access to landmarks, shops, schools on the way between home and work or home, work to home can also mean that you're more likely to choose to actively commute. And then there's more practical reasons. So if it's very expensive you, for you to park your car at work, then you may decide to forego taking your car and walk or bike. And then if you've decided to bike, if you have access to a place to park your bike and have supportive workplace facilities such as bike racks, then that is more supportive as well as a place or, or shower facilities or facilities to change where it can make it very easy for you to then cool down and prepare for uh, work. 
So that's what we know. And so we know a lot about home. We know some about work, but we don't tend to explore the home environment and the work environment together, recognizing that our experiences are shaped by these environments in both locations. And we also need to be exploring connections between these built environment infrastructures and how they vary across social environments and social experiences and how all of these together may support our decisions to actively commute. And so we had two main objectives for our research. The first was to characterize the different interrelated environments that we experience in our home and work journey. And so this incorporates built environments and natural environments, things like greenness and the quality of our air. And we wanna see how these environments are experienced for Canadian workers across the country living in cities. Second, we want to see then when we've characterized the different environments, which of these environments are associated with more walking and biking to work. And so the main data source that we use was the 2016 Canadian long form census, which was completed mandatorily by one in four Canadians. Now we worked with the 2016 census because it was what was available to us, the most recent census, when we started this study around 2022. And what was unique about the census, I mean, not only does it provide us with a rich source of data uh, that is representative of the Canadian population, it also provides information about where somebody lives, where somebody works, and what somebody reports as being the main mode of commuting to get to work. We then augmented or supplemented the census with information about the environment. And so based on where somebody lives and where somebody worked, we were able to incorporate information about the environment from the Canadian Urban Environmental Health Research Consortium, which is essentially a grouping of different measures that incorporate information about how environments around our area um, can be related to health and health behaviors. And so we were able to link this information based on the smallest geographic unit used by the census, what we call the dissemination area, which generally corresponds to information around several city blocks with about 400 to 700 people. And so the environmental data that we used from Canoe included a measure of walkability around a neighborhood. Uh, so the indices was called the active living environment scale. There's also information about cycling infrastructure based on how comfortable and how safe the infrastructure was for cycling. Cycling. There's information about the number of bus stops and information about green roads and greenness. Like these are all measures of built environments. Then we had information about physical in, in, in environments, so information about pollution through the nitrogen dioxide concentration, fine particulate matter concentration, and ozone concentration in an area. And then we incorporated an indices that measured social inequities in a neighborhood. So this was the Canadian Index of Multiple Deprivation that inc incorporates measures of instability and deprivation in an area. And then, then for a census sample, then when we factored in the sample that were of working age and working outside of the home, living in cities where we were able to have corresponding environmental data and didn't have any daily activity limitations that might prevent them from engaging in walking or cycling to work and lived within a distance and worked within a distance that we thought was feasible to at least cycle to work. So 15 kilometers, our overall sample was just over 2 million respondents. So a pretty large sample. And then when we wanted to identify the types of environments, into typical environments that we experience in our neighborhoods, we use a statistical technique called cluster analysis. Now, the way that this approach works, I'm just gonna give you a, a little bit of a, uh, an example, is that if you were to think of a reverse price is right scenario. So if you had a very large bag of groceries and you were tasked with putting them back in the supermarket. And so you would, if you're thinking strategically, maybe you would put ingredients or grocery items together that were found in the same places of the grocery store. So you would put your breads, your baked goods all in one cart together because they kind of appear in the baked goods section. You put your meats, your fish, your deli meats all in one cart and you put your house household items, you put your toothpaste, toothbrushes all in one cart. 
And so even though these items are not the same, they appear together in your experiences of the supermarket. Now, bring this back towards cities and environments. If I was to walk or you know, I walk from the uh, train station to my office in downtown Toronto, and my environment that I typically experience is a lot of traffic, a lot of intersections where I can walk. There's a lot of areas of very visible poverty, discrimination, and, and um, not discrimination, but a lot of marginalization I see in communities that I encounter as I walk to work. And so that is my experience. And when I bunch them together, that is my experience of my environment around my workplace neighborhood. Now, if I was to say you found four distinct environments or clusters, what we would do is then allocate them to the neighborhood and the home environments. And so when we look at all the different unique environments that people find, uh, that people have in their home and workplace environment, and we had about four unique environments, if we were to allocate them to where people live and where people work, from those four, four clusters, we would have 16 different combinations. Okay, and then from those 16 combinations, we use a statistical technique called multinomial logistic regression, where we look at the likelihood of using different forms of commuting to work. So active commuting, we group together walking and biking to work. Public transit, we looked at separately because it incorporates some walking and biking to work and using a motorized vehicle like a car. We also recognize that different groups have different barriers and facilitators to using active forms of commuting. And so we explored differences in our models based on age groups, based on males and females, for males and females also having a dependent child at work, recognizing that life happens. And if you have family responsibilities that can influence your decision-making around the type of commuting you use to get to work, as well as a distance from home to work using a straight line measure. And this is what we found. So we found four unique environments that Canadians encounter in their home to work commute. And Essentially, so that's what these clusters are, and essentially they vary based on the characteristics of the different measures that we looked at. And so this is this figure is essentially is, is, is a heat map, uh, a measure of the scores based on the different indicators. And so anything in red means they scored below average in a particular measure. Anything in beige is that they scored kind of midway, medium, and anything in green is that they scored higher than average. And so we gave names to these different environments based on what they typically represent in terms of these uh, measures. And so cluster one, we called low active living, high greenness, and medium social environments. And so what that means is it scored low in terms of infrastructure for active living, for walking, biking, bus stops. It kind of scored midway to, to good for other physical environment measures, uh, good for greenness but then kind of midway for social environments, the main measures being instability and deprivation experienced in a social environment. The second cluster and the third cluster are actually quite similar in that they were midway scores for the physical environment. The way they differed was around the social environment. So cluster two were areas where people experienced lower levels of instability, deprivation, and were quite ethnically diverse. While cluster three was the opposite, and they were more unstable, experienced more deprivation in those areas, and were had lower levels of diversity. And then cluster four was actually the polar opposite almost of cluster one, in that we had high scores for walkability and cycling infrastructure, a lot more bus stops available, um, higher scores or lower levels of air pollutants, and mid-range for measures of the social environment. And then what do the people, the workers look like in these different groups? And so when we look at the different groups, 12% of our sample were in cluster one. So 12% of over 2 million were in cluster one. And now across the clusters, you see that they're generally mostly male, around 55 to 53%. But in cluster one, you see that it's generally lower income. And so what I've highlighted are, are just some of the most distinguishing characteristics. And so 23% were in the fourth or the, I guess the, uh, the sorry, no, it, it's cluster one is actually the lowest, in, uh, higher income quintiles and so is cluster two. And so cluster one, 23% are in the fourth highest income quintile. 
and most of these people live in a house. Cluster two is similar as well in that it also has 34% in the highest income quintile. Most people live in a house. Also more people are have a post-secondary education. So 39% have a bachelor's degree or above and are married with a child. And also 26% identify as immigrants or recent immigrants. Now cluster three and cluster four generally make up lower income. So 31% are in the lowest income quintile in cluster three and 29% are in the lowest income in cluster four. With cluster three, 56% are living in an apartment and 26% are married without a child. While in cluster four, 44% are white, meaning the others are from other community, other cultural and racial backgrounds. 53% identify as immigrants and 51% live in apartments. And the largest group of people from the census sample were in cluster three, followed by cluster two and four. And then where do these groups live in, in Canadian cities? And so I just wanted to illustrate with some maps, just some ideas around where they might be residing. And so these are just some maps illustrating the home environments. And we wanted to give you some examples of some larger cities and some small cities. And so if you think about the most metropolitan cities in Canada, so Toronto, Vancouver, Calgary, and Ottawa, you find that cluster four, which is in dark, green um, in, the, in these maps are located mostly around the core cities, the downtowns, right? And then you see some, some clusters three too. So clusters three and four being the most supportive for active living, for walking, cycling, and using bus stops. You see them mostly around your downtown cores. And as you move away from the downtown, you see more of clusters one and two that have lower levels of active friendly infrastructure, but tend to have medium to high social environments. Now the picture is almost flipped when you look at smaller cities like Charlottetown and Sherbrooke, where you don't see much of the dark greens, the cluster fours, you see some of the clusters three in the downtowns, but you see more of clusters one and two, those areas with lower levels of active supportive infrastructure. And the next part is how are these environments around where Canadians live and work associated with the different forms of commuting to and from work. And so just to orientate you to this graph, if I, we've kind of split the left side to these cluster environments around where people live and where people work. On the very left are clusters from the bottom to the top going from cluster one to cluster four. And so cluster one again are characterized by having environments which are less supportive of walking and cycling but have higher or medium level scores for social environments. So environments that have lower levels of marginalization, instability, deprivation. But as you go up, you have higher and more supportive infrastructure for walking and cycling, but lower or middle level scores for social environments. And then within each of these home environments, you have those same cluster groupings for the work environment. And then the numbers that you see or these bars you see are the number of people out of every 1,000 that will engage in that form of commuting compared to a reference category. And so compared to a reference category indicated by the star at the very bottom, how many people or less or more people engage in that form of commuting? And so I've shown a star and we've chosen the reference category around cluster one at home and cluster one at work because we we feel like this cluster, which has the lowest levels of active supporting, active friendly supporting infrastructure as being the environment that we think would be least supportive of walking and biking to work. So compared to that, how much more likely are other environments in supporting active commuting? And so this figure shows how likely or less likely people are to engage in motor vehicle use to work, so using a car. And so you can see that combinations of clusters three and four in the home environment, and three and four in the work environment, compared to cluster one and one, in those environments, you're actually far less likely to use a car to get to work. Now, I just wanna illustrate one particular or two particular combinations, that is cluster three in the home environment and clusters three and four in the work environment. And you can see that in these environments, 186 or 196 fewer people use a car 
out of every 1,000 to get to work compared to the reference category. Now, where do these people, what other forms of commuting do these people engage in? So 186, 196, remember those numbers? Those fewer, those fewer people are using motor vehicles or, or, or those people are using other forms of transportation. And of those 186, 196 people in that same combination, almost 10 are in using or are, are choosing to use walking and biking to get to work. So those environments around medium physical and low social environments around where people live and work. And you can see a similarly high number around a more supportive or high active living environment in cluster four and medium to low social environment at the home environment and cluster three in the work environment. And you can see actually numbers decrease and you're more and you're less likely to walk and bike to work if you have if you live in areas where or work in areas where you have less supportive infrastructure and actually higher levels of social environments compared to our reference. And so we said about 10 people out of those 186 and 196 will walk and bike to work. And the rest of them seem to be using public transit. And so about 177, 186 use public transit in that combination out of every 1,000. And you can see that the numbers are actually quite high. And all these supportive environments and compared to the reference category, which is the least supportive environment for active commuting, are all in the direction where we're more likely to use public transit use. And so considering all these patterns that I've shown you, we find that these results and these patterns are consistent for different groups that we explored. But there's some notable highlights. So generally for men, males, we found that they walked, biked, and used motor vehicles more than females. Then younger workers and middle-aged workers are more likely to use public transit than older workers. And commuting distance, the longer your commute, tended to mean that you would choose to use public forms of transportation than active forms of transportation, or specifically active forms of transportation. And so back to my key messages. And so it's shown here that supportive infrastructure for walking and biking and having good clean air and more green environments can all promote active commuting. And so thinking about supports, policies, and interventions that can develop infrastructure that is supportive of walking and biking in these ways can be very effective. And the effects can be very effective for those communities that experience social inequities and low social environments with greater instability and deprivation and coincidentally, these areas also experience some of the most barriers towards meeting the physical activity guidelines. So they're the most inactive people and also have high levels of chronic disease. And so it becomes very almost too, you know, by a, there's a double whammy in that we can have big impacts in terms of addressing chronic disease risks and physical activity in these inactivity in these populations by supportive infrastructure. And our research also shows that we must consider the environments around where we live and when we work when we think about developing supportive environments and infrastructures. And so together, these environments contribute towards supporting more walking and biking to work. And so the strengths from the study is that by using the census, we had over 2 million census respondents that we could look at, and, and, and they're all representative of the Canadian population at large. And what's unique from our study is that we examine both the home and the workplace environments where Canadians kind of typically experience in their home and workplace journey. And by factoring in different environments together, we could incorporate the typical environments that people are exposed to, not just the built, but also the air quality measures and greenness and how these vary for different social settings. There's also some limitations and that we looked at the 2016 census. So this is a cross-sectional point, one point in time data sample. And so we can't tell if that these environments, whether these environments changed for people at any point in time, what relocating from one environment to another may look like. And because this study was done before the COVID pandemic, we don't know really what's going on or if these environments may have changed or behaviors may have changed during COVID but we still can understand important uh, insights on infrastructure nonetheless. We also accounted for as, in more, as many important environmental and social factors based on our understanding of the literature and what was available for us from the environmental data sets. But that considered, there were some important 
factors that we may not have incorporated or had um, that we, we that would be important to us to consider. Uh, things like traffic safety, social dynamics in communities, feelings of uh, safety uh, and, and traffic levels as well. And we didn't have information about multimodal commuting. And so what that would mean is you know, I take the, the train to get to work. I also then walk to get to work. So there's multiple forms of commuting that I'm using to get to work. The good news is that that is available in the most recent census, the 2021 census. So that's something that we're hopeful that we will look at and incorporate in future work. And so that's what I have to share with you today. I'm, I'm looking forward to your questions. And if there's anything that I can't um, answer today, please feel free to reach out to me or reach out to my co-principal investigator, Stephanie, and her email is also provided. So thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Biswas. That was a, a really interesting and thought-provoking presentation. So uh, a lot of questions are kind of pouring into the chat, but while we kind of uh, sift through them and uh, we, uh, I, I actually have one question that maybe we could start off with. And that is, you highlight a lot of nuance uh, based on your analysis. Uh, and this highlights that supportive work environments are often kind of, uh, it's not, they're not accessible across the population equally. And so, if we're thinking about applied strategies to build supportive uh, environments, do you think that a tailored approach would be best suited? Or do you kind of see that there's a need for more universal design approaches when it comes to supportive uh, uh, environments? Uh, so maybe you could start off by uh, addressing that question. Sure. So what really informed this research is that we're trying to move away from universal one size fits all approaches to really recognizing that we experience environments differently. And so where we came at this was recognizing that we experience environments differently. And so that's why we looked at different combinations of environments. And so it just turned out that we experience environments differently based on the qualities of our social settings and you know people who experience greater levels of other material things and having, you know, experiencing uh, lower access to certain environments and other things like that can influence our abilities to walk and bike to work. And so that in itself tells us that we need to be thinking about focus strategies. If I was to say, where should we focus? Uh, getting back to my messages, we, I mean, one important area to focus is to focus on those who have the most challenges in their lives. And so communities that are maybe experiencing a lot of marginalization, a lot of maybe poverty, a lot of areas experiencing things where they're not getting all their, what we call material goods or finding it very hard and uh, to incorporate walking and biking because they have a lot of things going on in their lives. Maybe that's a place to start in terms of infrastructure, which can be supported because, well, you know, it turns out that these people are engaging a lot of, in a lot of um, active commuting in itself and maybe, Supporting that more can, you know, you know, as I said before, move the needle towards greater levels of active commuting for these communities. Great, thank you so much. Uh, so another question that's uh, popped up in our Q and A relates to this concept of working from home. Uh, as you know, working from home, uh, uh, the opportunity to work from home has increased a lot since uh, the COVID nineteen pandemic, and also now we're working in hybrid environments where there's. Uh, kind of this dual uh, work environment between uh, at home and, and within your office place or your, within your workplace. And so I'm wondering, like, uh, obviously your data, as you noted, emerged uh, prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, but what do you think are some of the biggest kind of challenges and opportunities related to this kind of hybrid or working from home uh, situation that many uh, workers find themselves in? And how does it apply uh, to some of the data that you've uh, presented today? Okay, yeah, thank you. That's a great question. And working from home, I mean, with our sample, of course, it was before COVID pandemic. And we we also excluded people who worked from home because we wanted to get a sense of the home and the work journey. So that wasn't incorporated in this study. But we do have some insights from the literature. And so, of course, working from home means you're working from home. And so you're not doing a commute to get to the office. Maybe you are some days of the week if you're in a hybrid work arrangement. 
And so what that means in terms of the research studies that have looked at commuting patterns, active transportation, and physical activity behaviors is that by not doing that commute, you're lowering your levels of commuting and you're either not, or you're lowering your levels of active commuting. So you're not, not fewer people are walking and biking to work, which makes sense because you're spending more time at home. Now, I guess that's the negative in that you're probably, you're likely to see lower levels of active commuting maybe across the board. The maybe a positive is that it tends then because for those people who have then more time in their day to do other things because they're foregoing the commute, they're spending more time doing recreational physical physical activity. Um, they're rerouting that active that commuting time towards doing more exercise, and so we're seeing greater levels of physical activity for some populations, and so that's a positive. In terms of environments, there's been changes in infrastructure during the COVID pandemic and since the pandemic. And so that'd be something that we'd love to look at, uh, at least during the pandemic using the 2021 census and in future census cycles as well. Thanks, Abby. Uh, another person in the Q&A has asked about uh, theory. So when you were designing the study or when you were interpreting the data, uh, to what extent did theory play a role uh, in your research process? And maybe you could highlight some of the theories uh, that were relevant uh, if, if you did end up using them. Thank you. Yeah, so the main theory which I highlighted was using a very ecological, social ecological framework. And the conceptual framework, recognizing that multiple factors can interplay across multiple levels in terms of the behaviors that we engage in. This kind of when we were planning out and thinking, of, I mean, so that helps us understand how environments can influence active commuting. We also recognize that behaviors can be engage, uh, can be influenced by decision-making and influences around us. So we incorporated various health behavior change theories as well in our thinking. Um, I didn't talk about it, but there's various health behavior change models and understanding why people make the choice to actively commute or not was something that we also incorporated in our thinking. But always important to recognize and incorporate theory. And so we, we, we tried to do that as best as we could. Great, thank you so much. Uh, the next question is about the role organizations, workplaces or employers play. Uh, within the context of uh, the findings that you've presented today, what are some of the kind of relevant implications that you'd want employers to know about and what is their role and responsibility in addressing uh, issues related to supportive uh, environments? An interesting point in that we, I, I mean, you'll notice that I, I, there was hardly much mention of specific employers and we didn't really focus on that. And that was done on purpose in that this approach was meant to seem, I mean, you back to your question about universal or specific or strategic uh, approaches. The, the, when you think of employers, of course, employers, workplaces have a very important part to play in the behaviors of workers. I mean, we spend so much time at work, we spend a third of, at least a third of our day at work and the flexibility of work can shape or our experiences of work can shape our behaviors. But of course our behaviors, I mean, our workplace experiences are so context specific, are so individual. And so we wanted to move away from that and tell you, give policymakers and people who have control over interventions a sense of what could happen if we don't have to be thinking about some of the individual level factors that are you know specific to workplaces what would happen if you were to change environments structural things and how that would influence more people like populations of people because back to that model the ecological model when you can change environments, change settings, you can have, there's a lot of promise in changing pop, the, the behaviors of populations of people. So that's not answering your question. And so why would em employees play a role? I mean, of course, providing supportive environments. And I've shown that in the literature and that, you know, if you provide things like supportive um, time and availability for engaging in physical activity, making it making facilities available where you can park your bike, if there's showers and change rooms available, of course, those things can can play a part for people uh, in, in, in choosing to walk or bike and also environments around the workplace. So if you can create a supportive environment where people feel safe and comfortable to walk, they don't have to bike, but if they feel comfortable to walk and they have those environments around where they live to, that whole journey can facilitate more active commuting. 
uh, so I, what I'm hearing is it's just one part of a larger system that uh, we need to think about and uh, kind of aligns with a ecological model that you presented at the start of your presentation. So uh, kind of thanks for uh, bringing that full circle. And another question that has popped up in our Q&A relates to this idea of like next steps. So you've obviously identified some really key themes related uh, related to physical activity of workers. And so where do you plan to go with this? Like what, what are some like the next critical knowledge gaps that uh, you and your team think are important to address? Yeah, so, well, we're using, first of all, we want to look at an updated census. And so we've worked, at the 2016, worked with the 2016 census and using the approaches that we did, we, are very, we feel very comfortable in that our approaches have some value and that we can look at these interrelated relationships. And we want to look at these interrelated relationships or how these environments look like in 2021 and using the newest set available census and how these might have changed from 2016. So that's the first step. And so then looking at the environments from the 2021 census, how these might um, influence active commuting patterns and also look at whether you know the changing locations may play a factor. We'd have to think about the ways we can design studies to do that, but whether changing your environment at home at work may play a part, and also how you know the increases or decreases in physical activity because of active commuting, how may that play a part in your overall health? And so we also have an interest in looking at health outcomes that come from living and working in these different environments. Great, thanks, Avi. Um, you had mentioned at the start of your presentation that this research. Uh, builds on a close collaboration that you have with the Public Health Agency of Canada. Um, to what extent have your collaborations with the, the Public Health Agency of Canada or with other uh, partner organizations, government, not-for-profits, uh, to what extent have they informed uh, the work that you are doing and how have you utilized those partner insights to uh, help interpret the implications of your findings for different knowledge users? Yeah, so I'll just, I guess, recognize my background in that I am a work in health researcher. I, I bring knowledge of workers and the, the, the relationship between workplace exposures and health. And so I was very fortunate to have a strong working relationship with Stephanie, who is from the Public Health Agency of Canada, who brings a lot of insights on the working population, but also on areas that uh, kind of supplements my knowledge around the built environment physical activity and health. And so that collaboration has helped this study go move along. And then working with others and uh, getting insights from her, from her work in this space has brought important insights into my understanding and our understanding. I mentioned earlier that we have advisors who represent city planning, transportation planning, active transportation, um, and public health. And so we really much, and, and the work that we do at, at the Institute as well, we very much rely on the expertise of people who have lived experience, who work on the ground, who understand the challenges of, of infrastructure, understand the challenges of deploying investments or interventions. And we want to understand from them, what do we need to be thinking about? So, you know, recognizing we're academics, we're researchers, but there's there are people there who work in their day to day in these environments. So we work closely with them to really challenge ourselves and to incorporate their feedback into our work. So I think that has really, I think, enriched this research. Great. And, and so if you don't mind, maybe there's a, a bit of a follow-up to that. And as you were working on this research, as well as collaborating with uh, different knowledge users uh, on the ground, perhaps you can maybe elaborate on what are some of the kind of key issues that they're grappling with uh, in terms of their kind of day-to-day -day, uh, practice? And, and how did your evidence help support some of those uh, decisions that they're making or kind of key kind of challenges that they're grappling with? So I think, I think that, that when we start, when we've been doing this study, the understanding the barriers. A lot of that was based on the perspective of how does this study look like to you? And that what is some of the things that we need to be thinking about when doing this study? Um, we understood that understanding the experiences and challenges, the unique challenges of different stakeholders, different workplaces, different 
policy implementers is going to be important. And that was brought up to us in conversations with our advisors, with people that we connected with. And I think, I mean, back to, again, the question posed about where can we take this work? I think it would be valuable one day to explore some of these challenges in detail, something that it, it, it will be important because ultimately having that practical perspective, it will be important in order for any of this to take up and be taken up. And so having this space, hopefully all of you will have taken something from this work and by all means, reach out to me and let me know your experiences and things we need to be thinking about in terms of next steps, as well as how this information can be relevant to you and, and, and your stakeholders and the people you work with and uh, ultimately getting more Canadians to, to be active. Great. Uh, thanks, Abby. Um, we, we have a, a few more minutes. And so I, I would encourage the folks, if you have any uh, last questions that you'd like to pose to uh, Dr. Biswas, uh, uh, now's your time, uh, or, or indeed you can message him afterwards or email him afterwards. Uh, Abby, we have one question about uh, the role of occupation or industry. Uh, and to what extent was that captured in your analytical model? So uh, the type of job a person has or what industry they work in uh, and how might that have shaped their uh, active commuting decisions, uh, if at all? Yeah, so this model, this this, this study specifically, um, we incorporated, we recognize that occupations can influence your your decision making on active commuting, and what we did was we incorporated occupation in our modeling. We kept them. We we compared like for like ex occupations in our models, so that we essentially adjusted for them. We controlled for them in our modeling. We didn't look at variations based across of uh, uh, across occupations for this particular study. But then when I had shared with you that figure from Gabriella's paper, where we looked at different levels of commuting from 2006, 2011, 2016, we did focus on occupation. And we found that occupations that were physically demanding, more physically, the, the general trend, occupations that were more physically demanding tended to have lower levels of walking and biking to work, while occupations that were less physically demanding tended to have greater levels. So as I've shown you earlier, levels were still far lower than using a motor vehicle. And so I mean, we think that occupation has an important role to play, and maybe it's something to do with fatigue. Maybe it's something to do with the infrastructure and the facilities available in these particular occupations. And so, there, you know, where where can occupations make an impact? One, maybe changing or influ uh, influencing the conditions of work and addressing some of the the barriers that make it very challenging for people to engage in physical activity in general but also maybe supportive facilities and environments around the workplace may also enable more active commuting and physical activity for workers. Great, thank you so much for addressing that question. Um, okay, so we have a couple more questions that have come in. And so the first one is about uh, the idea of bike lanes. And uh, obviously this has become a topic that is almost like politically charged where there's different sides to the someone's kind of perspective on whether or not uh, bike lanes are valuable versus uh, like keeping the roads open for cars. And so uh, uh, Dr. Biswas, if you were to talk to policymakers or folks in charge of making these types of infrastructure decisions, what might be kind of the key message that you might share with them about uh, how to balance those competing priorities between like making sure traffic or car traffic is flowing versus uh, creating a, a safe bike lane infrastructure. Yeah, so luckily for me is I don't have to make these very complicated decisions. I think it's a very challenging to balance for sure for policymakers competing priorities. Um, I can only share the evidence and what the evidence suggests is when we have supportive infrastructure, naturally we have more cycling and more walking. And it's just a simple fact is that you provide more accessible infrastructure, more people will use it. And so, you know, of course, there, we, we looked at social environments and certain communities have more or less of pedestrian friendly and cycling friendly infrastructure. And so we need to be thinking about ways in which we can make sure that these people have more of them. I think that's a place to start. And especially because sometimes we think, you know, people with who have the most 
will more likely walk and bike to work. Our research suggests that people who have the most are probably more likely to use a car. And so we need to be thinking about a way in which we can really bridge these inequities in communities. And so thinking about which are those areas that have the, the you know have the most or the least and providing more in terms of infrastructure and providing it to them. Um, and, and that way we'll naturally support more walking and cycling and greater levels of physical activity in the Canadian population. Great. Thank you so much for that. Okay, so we have uh, time for one last question. And uh, this is actually kind of an interesting one. So it might not be captured in your data, uh, Dr. Biswas, but uh, the person's asking about uh, kind of like this, the almost like the technological transformation of uh, bikes. And so obviously now that you're seeing a lot of e-bikes kind of zipping around the city and um, they allow people to cover a little bit more ground. It might be easier for some who might not be like strong enough to utilize a, like a, a typical stationary or not stationary, but a, a typical uh, bike. And so maybe uh, like, is there any way to kind of capture the like, growth of these types of bikes, uh, bike sharing uh, platforms, uh, like how have they kind of played a role in uh, uh, affecting active transportation? So e-bikes were, I guess, not captured in the 2016 census. And so I can only speculate, but I can think, I mean, just being a person who lives and works and, and, and observes the world, it sounds like a great thing. I'm seeing it's become very, it's, I, I mean, we one way in which we influence this research is that you see the distance to work being an important factor towards biking and walking decision making. You know, longer distances mean you'll likely engage in more public transit, but because you're not engaging in as much physical activity, uh, you probably do more. I mean, e-biking e may do more to bridge the distances. I would be interested to know if physical activity is completely cut, but I think like, you know, you're doing a lot of, I'm, I've never used an e-bike myself, but you're still doing some physical activity using an e-bike. It supports it. And I think it's also probably supportive of different groups of, of, of people. Maybe older workers are, uh, it's it's helping uh, biking be more accessible to older workers who may have different physical limitations or people with physical limitations in general. It'd be something interesting to explore. And I'd be very interested in looking at data sets that can capture e-biking use and I think that'd be very really interesting but of course you know there is a cost to play a uh, cost involved with e-bike use so that would also be to, the, the looking at which groups use e-bikes is also something that would, mm -hmm. I'd be very interested to explore as well well uh Dr. Biswas thank you so much for this wonderful presentation and I'm sure a lot of folks are leaving with uh a lot of new information and a lot of uh, thoughts about kind of next steps and so thank you for addressing all these questions uh, and thank you for everyone who attended today. Uh, just a quick reminder that a recording of this presentation and the slides will be available on the event page. And if you wanted specific, uh, if you want to like learn more about the project or if you wanted uh, to uh, get more access to some of the images that uh, Dr. Biswas had uh, presented today, uh, please do message him and, uh, and see what is available at this time. And I'm sure he'd be uh, happy to chat with you. Uh, a quick... Uh, a quick kind of uh, note is that our next open speaker series uh, will be held on November 19th. Uh, and in this presentation, our colleague, Dr. Monique Shinyak, will be presenting on uh, a tool, which is uh, deciding whether to share health information at work. And this is a, a tool for workers with chronic conditions. So we, we hope that you'll join us again on November 19th. And uh, have a wonderful uh, short week and uh, all the best, everyone. Thank you so much for attending today.